All right, everyone. This is going to be a study of uh, Ruth chapter 2. It's going to be a little bit different, like I've said before. Sometimes preaching isn't all about, and teaching isn't all about screaming and shouting. Sometimes we just need to sit back and take the time and just study God's Word. That's that's the, the, the most important thing we're looking for is to understand, is to see a little bit more. How do we overcome a lot of things? Truth is, is through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is. That's how we grow. We grow. The more we know about certain things, the more we're able to use them, the more we're able to depend on. So all of us are wanting, and there's nothing wrong with just reading the Gospels. A lot of times that's what we do, and that's fine. But all the other books in the Bible, they're all point to Jesus as well. We learn this right here in this book of Ruth, chapter 2. So the Lord's going to bless us, he's going to guide us, and his Holy Spirit teaches us as we go over these verses. Like I've said before, it's not supposed to be about how much I know and you don't. It's not supposed to know about how much you do and I don't. It's not supposed to be about all these preachers out here that, wow, they just know so many things. That's not what's important. The main thing is to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. After you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit will teach you, and all these gifts are supposed to be to edify so what are these little sessions that the Lord's blessed me with? That's what they are. They're just to edify. Lord, give me these things for me to share with others, for others to grow and keep on sharing and tell as many people as we can. Okay? So let's start here in chapter 2, and let's just see what the Lord shows us and open up to us. Ruth chapter 2, and we're going to go to verse 1. It says, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabite, said unto Naomi, Let me know, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. You have to realize that Ruth and Naomi come back to town. There's not works and stuff like there is a lot of places right now. So what God had designed at the time was what? Something so simple. It may, it'd be amazing if we practice it nowadays. People, believe it or not, into these uh, when you had these rich people that had these big fields, God had actually told them that he was going to bless the nation of Israel. But here's what he didn't want because he didn't want pride. He didn't want things to grow in their lives. He still wanted to take care of the poor people. God, richest being in all creation, he still worries about the simple. He worries about the little people that don't have. You see that in Jesus' life a lot. Okay? So what were they supposed to do? This glean right here, if you want to take the time to study it, what happened? When a, when they would go through there and they would start plowing up a field or harvesting a bunch of uh, corn or whatever, wheat, whatever they were doing, whatever fell to the ground, they weren't supposed to pick it up. They were supposed to leave it. You say, well, you're going to just lay on the ground and rot? No, What it, the intent of it was so that the poor person, the person that didn't have a job, maybe they were going through a hard time, they wouldn't starve. They would have something to eat. So when it come time for the harvest, they could just go out and you, you, they could pick up as much as they wanted and take it with them. Not always wasn't a lot of stuff that was left over, but it was enough to where they would have something to eat. So this is what Ruth is pretty much saying. Just, hey, I'm going to go out and I'm going to see if I can find somewhere that they let me go and they let me pick some up. Just pray that the Lord blesses me and that somebody out there sees me and finds grace. So here we go to uh, verse 3. One other thing that I want to point out in verse 1 about this man named Boaz, you realize later in this in this first verse right here is he's a kinsman. What's a kinsman? A kinsman is somebody that's of the family. Okay? He's head of a family. Well, it's funny because later on we're going to get into this word, kinsman redeemer. What does the word redeemer mean? This kinsman redeemer, we have the word in Hebrew, it's called Gaal. Gaal, very simple, it's just three little letters. The first letter is a gimel. The gimel is designed to be the rich, the rich man. That's what he stands. This isn't what I say, this is what the nation of Israel says. Okay. The middle letter is the aleph. The aleph is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and it stands for the strong leader. And then the last letter in that uh, word Gaal is the lamed. The Lamed stands for the shepherd. So Boaz is an example of the rich man, the, the leader, or the strong leader, and he's also an example of the shepherd. 
That's what points him back to Jesus. This man Boaz becomes a symbol of Jesus. Why is that? Because that's exactly what Jesus did for us. Jesus was the rich man, the strong leader, and the shepherd. And what did he do? He left all those riches to come down to do what? To give us, to pay the price for us. This is what this little story of Ruth is supposed to show us little by little. It is a beautiful story in its simplicity the way it is. But there's a little bit underneath it that the Holy Spirit will reveal after you start seeing different things. Now look here at verse 3. It says, And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was too light on the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, Lord be with you. And they answered him, Lord bless thee. Now imagine if we would greet people that are our fellow Christians the same way that they did just right there. A lot of, we're going to take just a second because Ruth is also an example of how the church is supposed to be. And this man right here is the Lord of the harvest, so he's going to give us an example of how we should be. A lot of people want to say that, well, this, whenever two or three are gathered in his name, they want to think that, well, that's the church, and there's no problem with that. That is the church. But one thing that we forget a lot of times is that when we see somebody out, maybe at a grocery store, maybe it's somewhere where we go to work, Shouldn't we stop? Shouldn't we talk to that person there and also bless them and thank the Lord for them and just happen to see them? Then just stop for just a second. It isn't going to take a lot of time. A lot of us are in too big a hurry anymore and we need to slow down and we need to realize that, hey, that person, there's a reason why we run into them today. Maybe we just need to stop and pray for them. Maybe we need to just stop and encourage them. Maybe they're there to do that to us and we don't give them a chance for, them, for God to use them. Let's get back to verse 5. It says, Then Boaz said unto his servant, It was said over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? Now see, he's got a command, he's got a chain of command of his helpers. And he's asking him, he says, Hey, wait a minute, I haven't seen this lady before. Who is this? And the servant that was said over the reapers answered and said, It's the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves, so she came and hath continued even from the morn unto now that she tarried a little in the house. So look, one thing that you notice right off the bat of this Ruth, and Ruth is supposed to be a picture of the church, is that the reapers realize that, hey, she stays busy. She's been here all day long. She took a little bit of a nap. She laid down for a little while, but she's been here all day long working. Why is that so important? Why? Because you learn later on in some of the chapters in the New Testament that that's what it says. It says that the angels are looking down at the church for an example of how, the, how we're supposed to be. You say, well, wait a minute. He's not talking about angels here. He's talking about the reapers. Doesn't it say several times in the New Testament that the reapers, that Jesus is going to call them out to, for the harvest and going to draw all the people at one time? He says, look, don't don't pull up different plants. Don't pull up different things. You see, there's more to this story than people realize. This is actually a picture of Jesus and these reapers right here, a picture of his angels. Jesus is not only telling you this story. This story didn't just happen to be in the Bible. The Bible right here is the word of God, and the Holy Spirit has a, has a depth and has the ability that this book is alive. He can bring a lot of things out to us that we don't realize. A lot of people get bored reading the Bible because they really don't, lean to God to show them the truth of it. I'm not saying this to show you that, look, I know this and I've seen this. Look, the only thing I did, I didn't learn this because of how great I was. I learned this because we're going to see here in a couple more verses because Jesus is the one that sent these to us. Okay? Look here. It says, Then Boaz said unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence. But abide here fast by my maidens, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And thou art a thirst, go into the vessels, and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Now, I want to point out something very clearly right here. This is what Boaz is telling Ruth. And you say, well, why is this so important? Why? Because, see, Boaz is trying to explain to her, look, I can protect you. As long as you stay in my fields, as long as you stay in my area, all these guys, they work for me. 
So if anything does anything out of wrong, I have the ability to put them out. But here's the problem. If you go to another field, then I don't have no control over it. I can't protect you. I can't, I can't watch over you. I can't guarantee anything that's going to happen to you. You see, uh, this is also a point of Jesus. Why? Because this is what Jesus tells us. If you'll stay with me, if you'll stay in his blessings, if you'll stay under his wings, then he can protect us. You say, well, I thought God could protect me anywhere. God can't protect you anywhere, but sometimes you get out from under his wing and you go to other places and you're going to be like that little lamb that falls over in a cliff or you're going to be somebody that gets hurt. Yes, Jesus will come and get you, but you didn't have to go through that problem if you would have stayed in his field. Now look what he also tells her. Be in the field, and he said, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. That's where our eyes should be all the time. Our eyes should be on the work. Our eyes should be on the Father's business. That's what, Je that's what kept Jesus out of trouble a lot of times. Why? Because he said, look, you don't know what I'm here for. I'm here to do what the Father says. I'm here to do his will. That's one of the things that he did for an example to us. A lot of times we get distracted by other things because we take our eyes off the field. Our job is to do one thing, and that's to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout all the nations. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to stay in constant prayer, not just for ourselves, but for others. This is what he's telling her right here. Look, if, honey, if you'll stay in my field, I can take care of you. It's the same thing Jesus tells us. Then look, look at her reaction. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I'm a stranger? See, this is something I understand. A lot of people, especially here in the United States, they want to brag about, oh, this has been a country that God's been over for eons of years, and we're this and we're that. But the truth is, is that we're strangers. We were drafted in. We, it wasn't meant for us to be here. God, we're in a time period right now that it's called the period of grace for a reason. Why? Because Jesus didn't have to call us in. The nation of Israel is the one that's God's chosen nation. Those of us who have gotten in, we've gotten in by the grace of God. That means it's a gift. Nothing that I've done for it. All I've done is accept Jesus. But the gift was offered to me freely. All I did was accept it. This is what she's saying here. She said, look, you've shown me all this attention. Why? Because I'm a stranger. And look what Boaz says. This is, what, this is also a picture of what Jesus is trying to tell us. And Boaz answered and said unto her, I had fully seen showed me, it hath fully been showed me, all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother, and the land of thy nativity, and are come unto a people which thou knowest not henceforth. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Now, what happens right there in those little verses? What happens actually is very simple. He tells her, he said, look, this is one of the things that impresses me about you, is that you're out here working and you're taking care of somebody else. You're taking care of your mother-in-law. You came out here to a land that you didn't know anybody. You came out here to a place that you didn't, you didn't know a soul. And you're taking care of them and you're sharing this. You're helping them. That's what God's looking for in us. See, it wasn't a big surprise when Jesus shows up and says that these are the two things that you need to follow. You need to put the Lord God first in, your, in everything, and then you need to love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because this is something, this story of Ruth right here, this just didn't happen to be here. This is something that God placed here for a reason. Why? Because this is exactly what Jesus comes to do. Jesus comes to do what? He comes to take care of of those who, wa who wants to help others. That's what he's all about. He's all about helping others. Sure, he gives us salvation. He gives us his blessings. He gives us his gifts. So that what? So that we can take it on to others. <coughs> now look what here. Let's keep going here. It says, Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me, and for thou hast spoken friendly unto thy handmaiden. Though I be not like unto one of thy handmaids. And Boaz said unto her at mealtime, Come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip the morsel in the vinegar, and set. And she said beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. Now see, this is exactly... Boaz is so impressed by her, because she's hung in there all day long. She's been working all day. 
What does he do to her? He says, look, now I want you to come. I want you to sit at my table. This is exactly what Jesus is telling us. Look, if you just stay with me, if you'll hang in there, if you'll suffer through this little harvest that we're going through, I know it's hot out here. I know it's a lot of work, but if you'll stay right here in the fields with me, if you'll stay out here and you'll help my guys, then here's what's going to happen. You're going to sit down with me and I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you to eat off my table. This is what Jesus is talking about. This has more to do. This isn't just about this woman. This is what Jesus is telling us. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. Now here's something that, I'm, that we're getting ready to talk about. And Jesus gets all the praise for all this, because I wouldn't have known anything if he hadn't have showed me. There's a lot of prideful people in the world right now that they're going around saying, oh, I've won so many souls, and I've done this, and I've done that. Look, the fact is that this verse right here, I thank God for it. Why? Because pride's the worst thing in our lives. We start getting thinking a little bit too highly about ourselves, then we're getting ready to walk right into a mess. That's what it says. It said, right before the fall comes what? Pride. So what does this verse have to do with it? The truth is, is that a lot of the works that we get to be a part of, it's by the grace of God. It's no different than this right here. The Lord of the harvest is saying, look, I'm impressed by this right here. I'm impressed by this little church. I'm impressed by this little person here that they're doing these little things here and there. So here's what I want you to do, angels. I want you to drop a little extra for them. Why? Because I want to keep that going. I want to keep them motivated. Because they're going to use it not just for themselves to get all bragging and boastful and wind up with airplanes and all cars, but they're going to use it to spread it around. I want you to bless them with little things because they're going to use it for the way it's supposed to and it's going to point back to my Father. This is what this is supposed to be. That's what God gives us these little things. I thank God for these little crumbs and these little verses like this because it does. It knocks back down where we need to be. Look, the truth is that this is what the Lord Jesus said. I'm just an unprofitable servant, and I'm just doing my duty. That's how I feel a lot of times. I'm just an unprofitable servant. The Lord, all this wisdom's his. This is his word. It's been around for thousands of years. I just thank God for the little crumbs he gives. Look here at verse 17. So she gleaned in the field unto Eve, and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave it to her what she had reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today, and where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and, she, and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. Now, here's a very important point right here. When you start getting blessed by God, when God starts showing you little things here and there, and you start taking them to others, and you start sharing them, here's what's going to happen. They're going to know that something's different. Just like Naomi right here realizes that this isn't normal. This isn't, everyday, this isn't an everyday thing. Something's, who blessed you? Who's the one that gave you all these things? Because... What, what I see is I see blessings, and the blessings that you have, who's the one who noticed you? Somebody's took extra notice of you. That's how we should be in our walk. But here's the thing that takes that notch of pride down a little bit, is that what does she do? She doesn't talk about how hard she's worked. She doesn't talk about how many miles she's walked. She doesn't talk about how she spent the day. The first thing she does is she tells the name of the man that blessed her. That's exactly how we're supposed to be. Look, it's not about how many books I've read. It's not about how many people, how what college I went to. It's about the man Jesus Christ that died on the cross for me. Because if he hadn't have died on the cross for me, I would have nothing. It's the Father in heaven that sent that son to me. It's the son that paid the price for me. And then that same son went back to heaven and said, Father, they need the Holy Spirit, and I've paid the price so that they can have him. And then the Father sends the Holy Spirit back to us. You see, how can I boast of anything I have when everything I have has been given to me? 
That's as simple as this little story is right here. Ruth is a great example of how the church should be. It's not about who's got the bigger church. It's not about who's got the fancier church. It's not about who comes and preaches at these churches. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what it needs to be about. It's about this one man that's blessed us all. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left of his kindness to the living nor to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin to us, one of our next kin. And Ruth the Moabite said, He said unto me also, Thou keep fast by my young men until the end of all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou shouldest, that, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast in the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Now here's the truth. The truth is, it's just like right here. Naomi said, look, he's right. You need to stay with him. That's the same thing that I'm going to exhort to you right now. It's the same thing I'm going to encourage you to do. You need to stay with this man, Jesus Christ, right up to the end of the harvest. Right to the very end. Why? Because after the end of the harvest, he's the only hope we have. You need to just keep your eyes on what you're supposed to do. You need to keep your eyes in the word of God. You need to keep your eyes in prayer. You need to help all those that you see that you can do. Now, there's some of us that we can't do a whole lot, but whatever you can do helps. God's not looking for us to go out here and save the world. He sent Jesus to do that. What he's asking us to do is he's going to put little things throughout our lives for us to do, and we have the choice to go do those. He'll bless us. He'll take care of us. But we need to keep our eyes and we need to stay in the harvest until the very end. That's the same thing that God told uh, Isaiah. He said Isaiah said, how long do I do this? He said, till there's nothing left. That's what they're telling him right here. That's what, that's what Boaz is saying. You need to stay in there. What does Jesus say? We need to endure. We need to stay, hold on to this. We need to hang on to Jesus and we need to stay in the works. How long should I keep preaching? You keep preaching until the Lord takes you. How long should I keep teaching people about Jesus? Until the Lord takes you. That's what we need to do. I hope the Lord Jesus Christ gets the glory to this so that the Father can glorify through him. And I hope the Holy Spirit it's amazing to me how three of those how those three work. Hope this shows just a little bit more about who Jesus is. Hope it points to him because Jesus is the only hope this world has. May he get all honor and all glory, and I hope he blesses each one of you. Amen.